It's time for the Valley Town Fund to decide, should it invest in Alibaba? This is a very special stock choice because this is the first one which I have previously held in my personal portfolio. And whenever that happens, I will make sure to let you know so that there's no conflict of interest. This is one that I actually do not currently have. Furthermore, I should say that I sold it at a loss. A substantial loss. Alibaba is a stock that actually changed my entire view on investing. Now note that I am still a fairly new individual investor, still finding my own personal preferences and style. I thought I was a nearly 100% fundamentals investor until I met Alibaba, at which point when I sold a few weeks ago, I realized I'm 75% fundamentals, and about 25% trend, sentiment, momentum, 25% animal spirits. On Weeble, first things first as always, gonna sell off the free stocks I got thanks to you guys using my link below to sign up to Weeble and depositing $100. As usual, I'm going to use the funds that were gathered from the sale of those free stocks and from the Patreon in order to first make sure that the account has 50% of its money put into low cost index funds. And without further ado, let's take a look at Alibaba. Our first stop in researching Alibaba is Finbox. We learned that Alibaba is a Chinese company in the internet and direct marketing retail business. Uh, instead of reading this out, uh, Alibaba structure is kind of, can be simplified. Alibaba is perhaps uh, most simply compared to Amazon. Uh, they own a lot of online retail and they ship and deliver stuff. But that's not all. Alibaba is not just Amazon. Alibaba, and this is their annual report, and this is actually going to be the only page of the annual report that we look at, whereas for most other companies, I would look at the annual report and the quarterly report and try to figure out a bunch of numbers. Reason why we're not gonna do it for Alibaba is because look at all these companies that Alibaba owns. In terms of retail commerce, Taobao, there's Tmall, and a bunch of other stuff. They use AliExpress, there's Lazada, uh, the Wholesale Commerce, which is their online site, Alibaba.com. They own a bunch of digital media and television stations. They have innovation working. They own a big financial services group uh, called Ant Group. They run their own cloud as well, similar to Amazon. Uh, this is truly a behemoth of a company with a lot of moving parts. By the way, in order to do my usual calculation of a company, uh, what I would do is I would try to get all of the future cash flows of the company uh, and discount them back to the present value by adding them together. In order to calculate Alibaba's value, you would have to do it for every single one of these separate companies. And by the way, Alibaba has also invested in a bunch of other companies. You'd have to add those together too. That is very difficult to do. So in this case, we're gonna do a shortcut called trust the analysts. Now, perhaps the interesting thing is when you buy Alibaba stock, it is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, you may be at first surprised to realize when you're buying into Chinese companies that you're not actually buying the company. You are buying a share of a shell company that has been listed in the Cayman Islands. Now, believe me, the first time I heard this, I was like, what? Why would I ever want to do that? That's ridiculous. Because direct investment uh, is fairly difficult as these stocks are listed on the Hong Kong exchange. Much easier if it were to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. However, uh, these companies aren't allowed to directly list, so the companies get around it with a VIE structure in which they prop up a shell company in the Cayman Islands, they run a contract promising to share profits with the Cayman Islands shell company, which then in return 
follows the price, uh, the stock price of the Chinese company listing. It's a little bit spooky. There is some risk that someday China will close the VIE loophole because actually this is not allowed by China explicitly, but they've not said we're going to do something to stop it. They've just kind of let it go. Uh, and by the way, China isn't the only one to worry about here. There's also the U.S. Uh, who insist on proper accounting rules for Chinese companies. And if they were to not comply, uh, then Alibaba slash other Chinese companies could be delisted from the United States stock exchange as well. Now, in theory, this isn't actually that bad because uh, on either the U.S. side delisting them or China disallowing the VIE structure because your shares can be exchanged to the Hong Kong equivalent. However, this is obviously going to, if this were to ever happen, uh, there would be a massive rush for the Hong Kong stocks, not sure about the liquidity, and if China were to ever close the VIE loophole, then uh, all Chinese stocks that were listed on the U.S. stock exchange would crash and all future foreign investment into China would be uh, extremely questionable, far more questionable than it is today, and they would basically lose global trust. For that reason, I personally believe that China will not, you know, move to rapidly close the VIE loophole. So, oh, here's the bad news, the main bad news. Stock has fared poorly over the last month is a big understatement. Over the last year, Alibaba has been bleeding steady and I would like I would say slow decline, but you know, 43% in a year. That doesn't make you feel great. It's not rapid, it's just consistently down. <laughs> On this particular earnings day, Alibaba was hit by a $2.8 billion antitrust fine. I mean, they were hit by this judgment earlier, but it's at this point that Alibaba revealed that it had an operating loss because they had to pay $2.8 billion US dollars uh, for violating Chinese government law, uh, that they were being too monopolistic, so to say. And some people uh, do give the common wisdom, don't catch a falling knife. It's at this point, by the way, that I am going to say that I technically don't have to disclose this because I don't actually own a position in Alibaba, but because I personally, in my personal portfolio, which you can look at in Patreon, using the link below, if you feel like it's worth $5 to look at. Uh, this position bled me out for the last two months, and I personally took around a 25% loss on it. I invested somewhere in this range, and I got out right around there. So I got hit for 25% over July and August myself. Through this, I learned that I'm not a fundamentals investor, not a pure fundamentals investor. Uh, more on that far later. But suffice it to say, if you want to invest in this, you do have to be a fundamentals investor and close your eyes and know that you're in it for the long run. So I mentioned we were going to use a very uh, big shortcut. It's going to be very similar to Tesla, in which I just trust the analyst numbers. So what do the analysts think of Alibaba? Well, they are enormous bulls on it, actually. A huge wave of new analyst ratings happened after their latest earnings report, which just came out a month ago. And there's general consensus that this is a buy. Uh, with the price target being $272 as the average. This is the amount that the analysts believe that Alibaba stock will head towards in one year. This is an enormous amount of upside, 68%. And I was going to say every single analyst agrees that it should be that. However, apparently Stephen Ling now uh, does not like Alibaba. But hey, way easier to be an analyst who just says, hey, you should buy this stock instead of like actually doing it.
The other part of the evaluation shortcut that I like doing is these analysts provide earnings estimates and revenue estimates for the company. And it's good to see if these estimates have been trending up or down in terms of revenue and earnings per share. And as you can see, this has been trending downwards. However, uh, there was a big change downwards after that fine. It means that they're pricing in future potential fines and it's been generally sliding as well. Their last earnings report wasn't fantastic. Now let's take a look at the financials of the company real fast. I'm not going to go into any great detail because uh, it is very tough to value a company of this massive scale. Instead, I'll just point out that the revenue is growing at a truly great amount. It's clearly a company that's growing very, very quickly. It's the type of company that if they were in the United States would be comparable to, the, uh, to Amazon in terms of growth. And their earnings have always been positive as well. Not as consistent perhaps as you, was, you would like, but a big positive value with the only negative being that last quarter in which Alibaba again got hit by that 2.8 billion dollar fine. Checking their balance sheet, uh, Alibaba is in great financial health with a lot of total assets and not a lot of total liabilities. Now before you just go ahead and rush out and buy Alibaba, uh, yes Alibaba is going to be undervalued and it's even more undervalued than when I bought in However, there's all this bad news that you need to take into account, which I knew about, you know, a good amount of it when I bought in, uh, but more and more bad news came out and it kept pounding the stock. First little bit of bad news in this uh, checkered history is going to be the Ant IPO. So Alibaba was listed in the US Stock Exchange and this was a big deal. Uh, however, one of their big parts, Ant Group, uh, which Alibaba, of course, had a huge stake in, was going to list on the United States uh, Stock Exchange. However, this got suspended. Part of it is because one, Ant Group held a lot of private information about Chinese citizens that are, or Chinese data that they didn't want to be made public to the United States. Uh, China is very protective of this information. Another part of it may possibly be related to Alibaba's former CEO, Jack Ma. Jack Ma was a very public figure uh, who used to run Alibaba. There is a new CEO at Alibaba now. Uh, Jack Ma, after publicly criticizing uh, the Chinese government for misregulating the general big business, Jack Ma had to disappear from the public spotlight for some time. This was the beginning of Alibaba's slide uh, as people started realizing how much control the Chinese government had over basically any company operating in China. The pessimists would say, Wow, the Chinese government can basically do whatever they want to their companies. The optimists might say, but it's in the Chinese uh, interest to make sure that their companies perform well on the global stage. Uh, Alibaba is a crown jewel. Alibaba is going to you know, get some amount of support from the Chinese government. Or rather, they're not just going to gut Alibaba, right? More and more bad news continue to pile on. Uh, another IPO that actually occurred fairly recently, uh, last month in July, Didi, the ride-sharing service. Uh, after they IPO'd in the United States, China delisted their app from being able to be downloaded in China. Uh, why? Well, because they had recommended to Didi, hey, you guys probably shouldn't you do IPOs right now because uh, we're afraid of your data potentially being uh, available to the foreign governments. Didi disobeyed that and went ahead anyways. 
The lesson learned here is you got to play by the Chinese government rules, okay? After DD got delisted, again, pretty much every Chinese company took a tumble because everyone was like, oh my god, the Chinese, uh, China government has way too much power. Uh, look at everything they can do to these poor companies. There's this entire group of companies, the private education sector, uh, which China suddenly said, by the way, you guys are no longer for-profit companies. Uh, it is now the law that you must operate non-profit. This caused the Chinese education companies to significantly drop in value. Uh, because it turns out that when you are no longer allowed to make a profit in your company, uh, this makes the value of your company significantly less. This echoed across all Chinese stocks and drug all of the China stocks down even more. Uh, China continues to be very straightforward in saying, hey, by the way, there's going to be more regulation. You know, props to them for at least saying that it's going to happen instead of it being a surprise, I suppose. China has always been a fascination by a bunch of hedge funds and a bunch of big investment companies because it is the country that has a very, very high growth rate, uh, one of the highest growing GDPs out there, a huge population, and everyone wanted to invest in China. However, uh, due to all of those uncertainties, uh, quite a number of hedge funds have been selling, including Kathy Wood. And we're gamers. Here's some fun little news. Uh, the Chinese government has stated that video gaming is essentially an opiate, uh, you know, a big addictive drug. Video gaming is spiritual opium. Uh, the day that this report came out, the big Chinese company Tencent tumbled 10% alongside most other Chinese companies. And very recently, there is now a limit for everyone under 18. Uh, the amount of time you are allowed to play video games slash online games uh, is three hours, maximum of one hour on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So that is a lot of bad news. But this is what separates the fundamentals investor from the person who pays attention to the news. Now, certainly every single one of these pieces of information should be put into your valuation. And it's clear that you can't value a Chinese company the same way you value a United States company. China's government is currently very big on making sure uh, that they boost the general public's well-being. Their goal is to elevate a bunch of the poor people into the middle class. Uh, to do that, they're trying to reduce the wealth gap. And so they would like Chinese companies to participate in that. So hey, do you remember that Tencent company, which the Chinese government was calling basically a drug dealer, uh, spiritual opiates? Well, good news. Tencent is being a much greater social citizen here, uh, promising that it's going to double its budget for social aid in China, volunteering to donate $7.7 .7 billion to aid the government in its social welfare programs. Uh, this doubles its social aid to somewhere around $15 billion. Very recent news just released. Alibaba is similarly pledging $15.5 billion towards common prosperity for China. Now, how can anyone invest in China with all that bad news, right? Well, remember, fundamentals are what matter when you buy a company. What matters is the growth. What matters is how much money they're actually making. Look at that revenue growth. In order to buy this company in the United States, you would, and I'm not exaggerating here, you might actually pay twice the value that Alibaba is trading at right now. Look at that net income. It's just growing so much. 
Look at how many companies Alibaba has. Look at the huge impact in China. And it's for that reason that two very famous value investors, fundamental investors, invested in China. In quarter one of 2021, that's this year, quarter one being sometime between January and March, Charlie Munger, that's right, right-hand man of the Warren Buffett, used his Daily Journal Corporation to buy a very significant holding in Alibaba. Now, based on the time frame that he bought in, uh, he must have bought in at a price of $230 or above. And this wasn't a small investment. Uh, the way that Charlie Munger invests is that he has very concentrated holdings, making Alibaba the third largest holding in the, uh, in the Daily Journal Corporation at $37 million. Similarly, Monish Pabrai, another big concentration investor, uh, bought not only in Q1, but also added on to his position quite a lot in Q2. Monish Pabrai only holds three positions in his investment fund, uh, with Alibaba being the third largest position. And this is what a real fundamentals investor does. Price goes down, buy more. Uh, you're in it for the very long term. You're going to hold. Manish Pabrai in for $58 million. Uh, quarter one, must have bought at $230 at the low point. Quarter two, at least $210. So if you get in at under $230 or $210, uh, price right now is $160, that means you're actually investing better than Charlie Munger and Monish Fabrai in terms of getting in at a good valuation. That's amazing, and that's actually a big part of why I invested uh, at around the $210 range myself. So let's take a look at the actual discounted cash flow model. So when you just pull up the default, here's the number it gives you. Fair value for Alibaba, $268. That's using an assumption of a 10% discount rate, which means that you're demanding at least 10% on your investment, which actually is a very fair amount. Uh, that is significantly higher than the amount that I personally would demand for a company like this if it were in the United States. But if you add a premium for it being in the very risky climate of China, 10% seems reasonable. EBITDA multiple on this is actually very, very low. I uh, consider that for me personally, I would think that uh, Google and Amazon and a lot of the tech companies in the United States, uh, baseline, you would use 15, uh, but you would often see multiples at higher than 15. This is using a multiple of 10, which is very, very low. Those numbers together will give you 268. However, if you were to want to change that multiple to something that were to match the United States, like 15, uh, implied fair value goes up to $350. And if you were to want to value this company as if it were a United States company uh, at a fair discount rate at 7%, then the fair value of Alibaba is actually somewhere in the ballpark of $390. That's assuming that these numbers are fine, that they grow at these rates looks reasonable given their history, which I have looked at previously. You always want to double check the numbers. And you can see that over the past years, uh, Alibaba has grown at 40%, 35%, 50, 50, 50%. Uh, this is making a arguably conservative estimate, having the last year be 40% and having it drop down to 30, 20, 20, 19, 15%. You've got other assumptions put in, such as the percentage of revenue that's earnings, uh, the capital expenditures that Alibaba is expected to, expected to make, uh, the expected amount that they have to set aside for their working capital, the amount of cash basically for their operations, 
uh, the depreciation and amortization amount. All of this is nicely generated and it comes down to free cash flow number, the way that you value a company is again by calculating all of the company's free cash flows in the future. Uh, this particular spreadsheet counts it over the next five years and then assumes that in five years, the company is sold at a multiple. Uh, in this case, it's been assumed that it's 15. Uh, you could also use 10 and that multiple is added onto the cash flows in order to come out with its total value, which you divide by the number of shares to calculate the stock price. Uh, 389, if you were to value this uh, under a United States uh, valuation, or using the numbers as given in the spreadsheet of a discount rate of 10% and a multiple of 10, uh, fair value is $268, which is 68.4% upside, which means you're buying the company theoretically at a 68% discount. Now, if there's any fundamental investors out there, uh, they're practically salivating at the chance. That explains why Charlie Munger, who is a very long-term fundamentals investor who only invests in such a few amount of companies, would buy Alibaba, and why Monish Pabrai would keep adding at the bottom as the stock continues to bottom, I should say. This uh, $268 amount is kind of similar to the analyst price target of $272. You have to keep in mind that the analysts have projected that it's $272 in a year. So the actual number that the analysts are projecting, if you want a one, uh, if you want a 10% return, you divide this by one plus 10%. The analysts think that this stock is valued at $247 today. So why is the stock value so low? Well, as I hoped that I would emphasize, there is a lot of bad news around Chinese companies. Uh, there's such negative sentiment surrounding the stock. As a pure fundamentals investor, uh, you discount those. You consider what's important and maybe you apply a well, how much of that is actually important to Alibaba? Maybe it should, uh, maybe I should use a lower multiple when calculating it. Maybe I should use a higher discount rate. Maybe I use a gigantic margin of safety where essentially as a value investor, you want to not only buy the stock when it's under your price target, but you want it to be so far under your price target that there's a significant discount on top of what you think it's worth, such that even if it were to go down by a significant amount, you know, it would still be well above whatever you predicted. In this case, if you do want to do the valuation according to valuing it as a US company, and use the discount rate of 7% and a multiple of 15, and you come up with a fair value of $389. Even if you'll use a massive 50% margin of safety, uh, you get that the stock is worth $194. What this margin of safety means is that if you calculated the value of this company to be worth $390, but you were drastically mistaken in your methodology, and perhaps sure in china you should actually give the company a massive discount this is a very wide error of margin and even if you think it's worth 390 dollars if you have a 50 percent margin of safety uh, you could be wrong and still think that the company is worth 195 dollars and the stock price is under 195 dollars so that's truly amazing it's really a big test for fundamentals investors and I always thought of myself as a fundamentals investor, but that was until I experienced the whiplash that Alibaba gave me. Uh, you truly need to be willing to hold this for a very, very long time. And I figured out that I am part fundamentals and actually part animal spirits. Uh, animal spirits could be defined as technicals, it could be defined as momentum, it can be defined as sentiment, however you call it what I decided for my personal portfolio, as well as Value Town Fund's decision, is that I'm going to wait for this company 
to change in terms of sentiment before investing. There's a bunch of moving averages here. Uh, the pink one is the 20-day moving average. That means what has been the average price of Alibaba over the last 20 days. Uh, this is the last 20 days, this is the last 50 days, this is the last 200 days. And my general idea can actually be just summed up to this moving average. When the stock starts to go up, when it crosses the 20-day moving average, and I haven't quite decided if I'm going to use 20-day moving average or 50-day moving average, or perhaps I'm going to use 20-day moving average, and then when it drops, if it drops back down below the 20-day moving average, I'll sell again, and if it goes up above the 20-day moving average, maybe I'll buy again. Uh, just a very chicken way of tr um, investing in BABA. You'll have the trend going with you when hopefully someday it goes up again. But boy, has this been a painful road for anyone who invested in BABA because the, it looked good here too. It looked good here, it looked good here, it looked good here, it looked good here. It looks good here. Uh, at pretty much every single point, uh, you would have run your discounted cash flow analysis and you would have gotten, wow, Alibaba is a great deal. Alibaba taught me a big lesson. I'm not just a fundamentals investor, but I also do care that it has at least neutral sentiment, you know, that's trading at least flat. That's not just a knife that's slowly sliding down. I probably will be scarred for a very long time. I'm not trying to catch a falling knife again. And, you know, props to Monish Pabrai and Charlie Munger for being able to be these fundamentals investors bastions. Uh, at some point, certainly, the stock price will start reflecting fundamentals and will head back up. And it almost feels dumb to say this, but basically, the price is too low to buy right now. I would like the price to go up a bit before buying it. But that's actually exactly what I'm saying. And I realize that's irrational, but it turns out that even when Alibaba hits like 180 or it hits 200, in my mind, it's still gonna be undervalued and I will still feel content buying it at those prices. I will never get the bottom if I choose that strategy, but I also will not get burnt by it continuing to slide down. This is where there's a lot of different schools of investing. And what I just told you is directly in contrast to one of the greatest investors in our lifetime, Charlie Munger, and of course, uh, Monish Pabrai, as well as all these other hedge funds that are still holding. A bargain to pick it up, but... Huge amounts of variance, expect a bunch of bad news. No idea when the bottom's gonna hit. It might be now. Uh, every single time here, like this traded flat for a while, it could have been here. Like at this moment, it did trade above the 20 day moving average. And at this moment, it certainly looked like it was going up. That was above the 20 day and the 50 day moving average, but that was a bait. It was a bait. So, you know, even trading with the trend doesn't always get you. Uh, you would have bought up here if you traded with the trend, and then it would have gone up, and then you'd be happy it went down, and then you'd be like, uh, it depends on how disciplined you were on staying with your strategy. You would basically buy there and then sell to loss, but that would be good news because it would continue to slide. Very strange of me to focus so much on a company's technicals, on a company's trend, uh, but this is something that Baba has scarred me with. Now, the counter argument to these little, you know, in the long term, who cares really that you bought in here and that it dropped for a bit? I think that in the long term, stock markets are efficient. At some point, sentiment will change and this stock will go back to 200 to $400. The question is how much will it slide before then? In the short term, I believe that markets are not completely efficient and that the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Essentially, as long as you do commit to somehow getting Alibaba stock, looks like in the long term, this is undervalued. So Valley Town Fund will follow a similar strategy as I will in my personal portfolio. Uh, I am going to buy this stock in my personal portfolio as well as the Valley Town Fund uh, when this starts trending upwards in terms of sentiment. 
So in terms of Alibaba, I'm currently not quite ready to enter the position for two reasons. One, the sentiment is still negative. Though it appears to be trending upwards, I need to give it a little bit of time to confirm that, so to say, to confirm the animal spirits. And secondly, and most importantly, I cannot buy Alibaba right now because if I do, it'll cause a wash sale rule in terms of the tax loss harvesting on my personal portfolio. Uh, because after you sell a stock at a loss, if you want to claim a tax deduction on it, you cannot rebuy the same stock within 30 days. However, I had a plan for this. Uh, if there was a sudden uptick in Alibaba, if there was a sudden shift in the sentiment of Chinese stocks, uh, I was going to invest in FXI. FXI is the large cap China ETF which invests primarily in, well, entirely in uh, very large Chinese companies, of which Alibaba is one and is one of the primary holdings of this particular index fund, uh, so is Tencent. And my general theory is that basically all the Chinese stocks broadly follow the same story as Alibaba. They're all mainly pretty undervalued when compared to their US counterparts. FXI is above the 20-day moving average and almost approaching the 50-day moving average. Uh, that's about the level of confidence in terms of investing with the trend that I would want to go for before entering a position. And as a general note on my personal style of investing, because I don't want to be stuck with the falling knife again, uh, if the stock ever goes below its 20-day moving average while I'm on this you know, paranoid type of investing, I will probably sell, which means I'm guaranteed to buy high, sell low, so to say. But at some point, I'm going to catch it while it's on the uptrend. Uh, the important part is just to keep doing that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to commit 10% of the Value Town fund uh, into the FXI, with the plan to move that specifically to Alibaba once I can. This is actually very similar to how my personal portfolio is operating right now, by the way. As another disclosure, I am currently invested in the FXI and my personal portfolio has the same plan. I will sell out of FXI and buy into BABA as soon as I am allowed to uh, for tax reasons and when the sentiment for Alibaba has changed. Also, I am committing myself to sell if it looks like there's another shift in sentiment back to negative sentiment for China. So there's where the Valley Town Fund stands right now. We got the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund, we got the Vanguard Total International Index Fund, and now we have the iShares Trust, iShares China Large Cap Index Fund, which is a substitute for Alibaba. So thanks again for being interested in these videos. Uh, support the show using the link below. If you are interested in Webull, you get stocks, I get stocks. And thank you to the Patreon subscribers who fund the Valley Town Fund and also get the minor perk of seeing this amateur investor's personal portfolio. Uh, recently made uh, quite a few changes to it and if you're joining during the start of the month, uh, that's basically the best time because billing is every start of the month. Thanks for watching!